Welcome to another stream here at LightingBot. We are actually one minute ahead of schedule. So, thank you for watching. As usual, we appreciate that you like, subscribe, and comment. And you are welcome to ask questions during this uh, conversation we are having. We're going to pick and choose as we see uh, necessarily, based on, you know, NDA and these things. So, with no further ado, I would like to welcome our guest today, uh, Harid. Hey, hey Amit. <laughs> How are you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. What about you? Yeah, it's good. How's your weather? Oh, it's ever-changing. British weather, you know. Yeah, mm. today we had, I think, so far, three different weathers. Three different weathers? Yep, yep. Yeah, so we had, like, three different seasons. Like, <laughs> we had spring, we had... I think we didn't have summer yet. Maybe at night, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the thing with uh, which I noticed in, in Britain is uh, when the sun is up, people will like, okay, the sun is up, let's go out, let's enjoy the weather very quickly because we might just have one hour to enjoy it before it starts raining. <laughs> That's how it is to live. Oh, when, I, okay. when I was about to move to England, my friends who studied in England told me, hey, the weather's been changing, be careful. I was like, man, how bad it can be. But yeah, it can be unpredictable, totally unpredictable. Exactly. So just to introduce people, because obviously not everyone knows you, uh, who are you, uh, where are you working, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stuff like that, basically. Yeah. And just before we start, though, I would like to say something, as most of you probably know, that there was a like an earthquake uh, that hit Turkey and Syria a month ago. So before I start, uh, I would like to pass my condolences to who affected by the earthquake. And hopefully um, everything will be better soon let's say so yeah uh about me i'm harit it was it was a good pronunciation by the way it was not that bad believe me yes. <laughs> so um i'm a lighting artist i'm in the industry for almost five years now i'm currently working at splash damage on transformers reactivate here's like yeah i'm wearing the t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> uh, previously, I worked on uh, Formula 2021 and Kena Bridge of Spirits. And yeah, I'm currently also a guest lecturer at the Vertex School. Also, previously was a mentor at Bacchus University on lighting. So that's the brief of me. Cool. That's good. So different experiences so far. Yeah. But with this experience that you have achieved so far, mm -hmm. there is obviously struggles on the way, challenges and so on. Let's talk okay. a little bit about uh, where you're actually from and how mm -hmm. it's been learning and growing from where you're from to where you are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm originally from Cyprus. My mother is from Cyprus and I was born in the north side of Cyprus and my father is Turkish. So I'm half Turkish, half Cypriot. Um, I was born in Cyprus. It's like a politically unstable place, unfortunately. So it was a bit harder for me at the beginning. So um, how I discovered my interest in lighting was back in university. I, I studied visual communication design at uh, Eastern Mediterranean University. And I noticed my interest there. And um, from there, Actually, I um, self-fought myself and then moved to Istanbul. So that's like another story. So that was the the first struggle that I had because when I started, uh, I didn't had anyone that will tell me what exactly lighting is and how to do is what not, yes and no's. So I needed to discover everything by myself. Even I needed to walk the road by myself in the professional side. So um, I needed to find my tone, find my way, find my interest, and then develop myself in the techniques and the art styles and other stuff. So th that, that was a, quite a challenge, especially the north side of Cyprus is, again, uh, it's an isolated place because of the political issues. So it was back, at least when I first started, it was a bit harder to, um, to get globally recognized it is a bit harder and then when i moved to turkey to chase my career the, my struggle there was the turkish games industry is purely on like not purely but 90 percent on mobile gaming and um when i used to tell people oh, oh there's one of my students hi Ezgi. <laughs> i feel you deeply <laughs> so oh by the way him hey sam Welcome. And um, back to the topic. Uh, when I was telling them, oh, I want to be a lighting artist. And people keep telling me, what? A lighting what? 
who would hire you to drop some point lights in the scene? And it took me years to tell people that lighting is an expertise. And now it makes me so happy to see from my students and like from other people from Turkey who's just sending me messages and reaching me out and telling, hey, I'm interested in lighting and I'm inspired by you. It's like, it's always a good thing to hear. So um, that, that was actually the initial struggle I had to find my way and to prove myself to the people in Turkey who didn't have the slightest clue about what lighting art is. And then to the people in global and showing them who I am and if, hopefully if I have some recognition to find that road, if that makes sense. So that is the, that's probably the first, like, and probably the biggest struggle I had. Okay. And how did you kind of defeat it or conquer it? Like, what would you advise someone else to deal with similar challenges in their hmm. countries, for example? What, do you have any thought or, or inspiration for that? Oh, um, yes. Um, to simplify it, it is generally being maybe brave, but not, not a fool. I know it sounds like hard, but it is a matter of finding and knowing yourself. So the, the path I walked will going to be different for everybody. It's going to be super different for, for you, for me, for X, Y, whoever. It is important to find this, this entry point of this path and being true to it and being brave enough to accept when you failed and when you succeeded. But it is, it is an important thing. Also, one, one point is like a failure is not an end. What I see from what I learned from my experience, a failure is an opportunity to learn, especially um, the failures are a better teacher because mm -hmm. when you fail, you see more stuff than you're succeeding because you're drunk with success when you're successful. But then when you fail, this can be like a rejection from a job. This can be failure to get the recognition at first or you name it. Generally, the failure is the best teacher. So I believe in that. So people shouldn't quit because they failed because this, is, this does not mean that you're going to fail a year later. A good example for that from my experience is in my first year, I worked in a Turkish studio and then uh, the studio closed its real time department and I was jobless for a year and basically no one wanted me in Turkey, no one. Because I thought, ah, even my modelers can do, why should I hire you? You mean nothing. And I digged through the dirt by myself and joined to the communities and joined to the people, formed the, um, the network. Meanwhile, I developed myself as well. I joined as much as podcasts I can, learned from people, reached out people asking questions. And uh, I asked myself this question, how did, what are you missing? to reach where you want to go. And I found those, walked through them, and, you know, stood bravely against them and, uh, you know, these kind of stuff. I couldn't connect it to something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I mean, this, this is basically uh, how you can find your tone because now uh, when I look back to what happened to me in this five years, if I became someone it is because of my failures. It's not because of my successes. Yeah, makes sense. I hear you have a, a police car or siren. Oh yeah, to me always. All the time. It, it, it was an ambulance man. I'm living so close to an ambulance park yard, so they just pass yeah, I all get, the time. I get them all the time as well. Get it is annoying or... in Britain. They are so loud and high pitched. <sighs> I was. Uh, I remember when the first police car came. The light came through my curtains, bounced around in over my bed, and I was woke up. And like, what? What is this disco <laughs> light coming from? What's going on? Like, my first interaction with ambulance was the first day I arrived in Bromley, and I was like walking to see the high street, the like you know the shopping street here. I was like, wow, that's annoying. That's so high pitched. It was like compared to ones in Turkey, it was ah, it's annoying. Yeah. 
it's quite a lot. Naturally, because I was working on As Dusk Falls and there was a lot of police scenes, I took, started taking photos and recording it <laughs> to get the reference of how far does the light actually go. Mm. And surprisingly, it goes far, these police lights. They're really strong. And I didn't think they were that strong even during like overcast and everything. So it was good referencing. Oh, so. I, I love to do that as well. Uh, my lovely girlfriend is here today as well. And she knows my phone is full of horribly composed photos just enough to show like you know the interactions with the lights and stuff and just just foreign ideas as well i have tons of photos like that or like i'll call them references because like, again the composition in them are horrible like, because i just take them as references well, it, it so helps. do it do you take the references for yourself or do you post it somewhere or what's your idea oh no i this? don't post them because again they're just terrible just enough for me to remember what I see because um, we can talk about it later but like there was a technique that I use how I call as conscience um, how to, to translate in English um, conscious observation so mm -hmm. that uh, because the cameras and our eyes are different they, they see world differently so um, it is something actually I grabbed from James Gurney's book um, Color and Light I think mm -hmm. it was Color and Light this is a really famous book and I, I actually I uh, recommend uh, everyone it, to read it. It's behind my green screen. Well, it's too much work to go and grab it because it's a huge screen. <laughs> screen Until I have it back with me, but I don't want to, want people to see the mess behind me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, James Gurney, search him, you'll find it. It's supposed to be color and light, I think. So in yeah. that book, he was talking about um, rather than taking photos, he was like observing the lighting situation and try to keep it in his mind as much as possible and, just, you know, to observe that subtle detail so that he can portray them in his paintings and he's doing really successfully his work is amazing dinotopia is just amazing and this is something i also do as well so i when i take this photo just to remind me or sometimes to keep the scenarios in mind because um it's like the light ratios or how the light behaves in a natural thing also i, I have a, a light meter i bought recently i go everywhere with this thing and I have like recordings of Lux uh, readings from different places, from Turkey, from Cyprus, from Bromley, different scenarios, days, nights. So to, just to compare them and always good to have them under the hand. So when I need to, oh, I need to do something. I need to do that. Oh, that might be a good Lux to use it. Oh, that was like that. And, yeah. so tell me a little bit which brand you bought. Or do you recommend the light meter you use? Oh, I, I do, but it's just... I think it does not have a brand. I bought it from Amazon. It's, it says MT912 light meter. Um, I just grabbed one. MT912. It's like a really handy small light meter. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, this one. Are you? MT. There's quite a few. So it's the general. You pick the general one, and then yeah. there's quite a few choices. <laughs> I, I just wanted to get a, like a basic one at first to see how I will get along. Maybe I'll get more like a fancier, more expensive one in the future with light white balance, because yeah. I want to have one uh, with the white balance as well. Yeah, and I would love to have your recommendation later and the link for it, so I can share yeah, it sure. later as well mm -hmm. in the in the description. Uh, we let's do a quick question, Wesley. Thank you for joining and watching. And hey, obviously, uh, Sam and the rest of you were already called out by uh, Harid, so <laughs> well, just keep <laughs> it. So uh, he's asking, how much did you learn about lighting in school compared to how much you did teach yourself? Oh. Basically? That's an easy question, none in school. Actually, not none. Um, if you consider my studies on like graphic design, like 10% maybe, but rest is observation because again, in university, I didn't learn too much about lighting because again, I was not uh, studying anything related to games or photography or video, which we had that lectures back then, but young me was not planning to be a game artist back then, so I didn't care too much. So uh, basically 90% of what I know at the moment is me teaching myself or like, mm. I can say like there are like inspirational people and really good art directors and really good uh, people who I connected showed me some stuff as well but then again it's like kind of like a self-training kind of because it's not an official lecture that taught me these stuff 
Okay. So I think it's an interesting topic because more than likely people are learning something from university it's just not what you end up doing often it's like it's not the the, the stuff you're passionate about because it's like more of a journey you're going through you're mm -hmm. learning stuff and then later on you're really like, oh i like lighting and then it's more of an introspective journey to think about maybe you learn something about color somewhere maybe you learn about something yeah. else yeah. it's definitely an interesting question and hey patrick pa patrick Hello, patrick Thanks for joining. A uh, nice chicken uh, thing. <laughs> I can do it going there. Um, hey, Borky Design. Thank you. I forgot your name. Probably should know it actually. But thanks for joining. Um, so, Patrick is a saying. You mentioned that you learned most of the stuff on your own. What were your main resources that you think are still applicable to this day? That's a perfect question. So, one mistake that everyone like most of the students or like young artists who want to learn lighting think the lighting that we are doing is something by itself but actually it has history of hundreds of years painting theater movies photography basically what we are doing is the modern version of those it is as if like we, we used to take photos right with manual cameras. Now we have digital cameras. It's, it's, it's something like that. We used to have theater, then cinema come in. It's something like this. So basically, anything that you can learn from these other disciplines, it can be cinema, theater, set dressing, um, photo manipulation, which I'm originally from. Uh, these will help you along the way. So the most important thing is to understand the fundamentals. The most important thing to know is the basics is is here as long as you know what you're doing in here the tools are ever changing it is now unreal 5 it used to be unreal 4 then unreal 3 whatever and when you become a professional the engines that you use will change it can be let's say you're working at ea it can be frostbite it can be something else a rage in um, rockstar for example so the tools will change but as long as you know these theories you'll be good you just need to learn the tool so um the main resource long story short anything that you can find relating to lighting photography cinema theater the yeah, the, yeah. fundamental skills which is probably yes. more important now with the ai coming into the picture you know being able to construct a good image you know, a good story is, is, is probably more important now as well and mm -hmm. probably more important 40 years from now. But by then I'm probably retired anyway, but who cares? <laughs> I don't think I'll ever retire. <laughs> well, I'll probably retire as a lighting as more than likely. I probably have, I'll, I'll probably follow the trend and figure, okay, what's the next thing that I need to go into? You know, mm. I wouldn't just stick to one thing. I'm, I have too many interests to I, can, to I can't really see myself just laying down lazily and doing nothing, man. I don't know. Exactly. You gotta, you gotta do something productive or yeah. passionate about. So, uh, thank you, Evan Evangeline. Thank you for asking the question. Oh, uh, how did you not lose? As well. well, of course, they're gonna take the opportunity to get some free questions. <laughs> oh, we, we can, we can, let's ignore her. <laughs> <laughs> how did you not lose your hope for preparing yourself for a job abroad? Oh, um, well, I mean, I know that's that's super hard and. Especially um, right now, which there's a global crisis. I know it's so hard not to, but stay true to yourself. I know you, you are my student, you're talented. Just believe in yourself, keep what you're doing, keep improving yourself, be at the right places at the right times. It will happen eventually. So, I mean, um, I don't do anything particular, to be honest, because it's just my character, I think, because through the years, I am like hardened and I think I'm having, I can kind of stop myself freaking out if that makes sense. So maybe it's, it's just a matter of being more mature. And again, if you heard about what I said before, the failures are the best um, lecturer, best uh, guide. So yeah. I mean, I don't do anything specific not to, rather than keeping my spirit high and um, like believing in myself and seeing my ups and downs and working on them. 
having some confidence in your ability to but again something something really important though sorry to interrupt you um, because i see this unfortunately in, in a group of people being overconfident it is also bad as well be confident don't be a fool know yourself well don't be arrogant yes be humble and confident like, exactly. ask questions be willing to learn from everyone exactly. and keep learning really um so he's just saying fundamentals has always been key good thanks for coming oh that 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 guy is a special one ansel and my good friend from eastern mediterranean university <laughs> one of the probably one of the most famous streamers in youtube about techie stuff blender so good to see you man it's good that he's joining hey manuel nice to see you joining as well so let's talk a little bit about your process now um mm -hmm. we were Discussing your idea, ideation process, application process, you know, mm -hmm. things to pay attention to from start to end. Uh, how do you want to explain that? How do you want to go through that? Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, it starts with an idea. And that I, you can't really know where this idea will come from. It can come from something really simple that you see in the streets. That's why I have the light meter and, and the, the stupid photograph that I was talking about. It can be a movie. It can be something quite normal and there was a once one occasion where i saw something in my dream literally i woke up noted down and went back to sleep i'm yet to finish it because it's like going to be something like a bit harder to do because it's just not lighting and like set dressing and all this technical art stuff as well so i need to create some time for it but anyway this is something else uh, so it starts with the idea and then um it follows up with gathering the references for it. Although it starts with an idea, or even can be a photograph, it can be like from a movie, still it is super important to have enough references detailing everything. Because basically what we do is a replication of the real world. So it is always good to have everything under control and don't just rely on uh, pure observation. Yes, I mentioned that I'm doing a kind of like an, a conscious observation, but still with that, I have tons of concepts and references or whatnot to support that idea. So two, um, concept gathering. Three, experimentation through the engine. And four, the execution. So this is like the, um, the summary of it, actually. So... My question is, how do you know if it's a good reference? That's a really good question. If it helps you enough to see what you're looking for, then it's a good reference. Because, for example, let's say that you're working on a sunset, a natural sunset scenario, and you have a heavily edited photograph that has the blacks crushed. You can't really see the nuances in that, right? Only thing that you can grab out is maybe the sky texture you grab something out of it. So there's always something that you can grab out of it, but you need to be careful. Again, that this is where this conscious observation comes in because the, the, there are the edited photographs. Eh? We all know it, like super orange sky and pitch black shadows. But I know how a, a sunset naturally looks like. So I just compare that image of my idea with it and then use it. So generally, that's that's probably something that I never thought of. But again, it, if it's not helping you in anything, it's not a good reference. Because imagine, because we both teach, we both have students. Mm -hmm. So imagine a student comes to you and uh, you're trying to educate and correct something and mm -hmm. you find out that their reference is misleading or incorrect mm -hmm. to begin with. Would you say... Because that brings us back to something else you said earlier. Would you say that's where the lighting fundamental and having a good eye is even more important? Because you can be very technically good and you can do your stuff and you can, you know, mm -hmm. we can be very good at it. But that doesn't really help if your reference is incorrect and you're yeah. trusting the reference. That's so, true. so that's why I asked the question is because a lot of the mm -hmm. times people on on Discord who are asking for advice, they either don't have a reference first of all, <laughs> so there's nothing at least for me to go by mm -hmm. then it just becomes a personal opinion really it's a subjective feedback right and then if they do have a reference often it's um, the ability to pick the right reference and knowing if it's overexposed underexposed yes. the size the intended look obviously so this is the part where having a 
a mood board with multiple resources comes by because if you stick to just one image or similar images then you can't really know if they're correct or wrong so it, back to the thing that you said if any of my students comes me with references that's misleading I'm, i probably ask them all right why do you use this reference for what do you want to get out of that and what do you think will be useful for what you are doing so I force them to think more about what they can get out of that and go deeper in about what they're looking for. And when you know what you're looking for, when you made up your mind about it, it's probably easier to gather those references. So in the initial phase, it is better to have a, like a large mood board with mood board with um, diverse set of stuff and then, you know, cutting them out to the ones that are going to be useful. Hmm. Again, it, it is difficult. It is quite difficult because, like you said, it can be misleading. So but it takes experience as well. It's a matter of, like, as you do this stuff, as you look at the photos, as you progress through it, it is easier to distinguish what is useful, what is wrong, or what is misleading. That's a better word. So it's a tough one, actually. It is, because when I remember some of the training I received was learning to look at the references initially and learning to understand what's a, a, a good reference and what, and what makes a bad reference, because it's, it's not really anything mm -hmm. wrong in anything. Well, because if you book an image, because when I do my photography, I do a lot of um, either overexposure or underexposed as an artistic photography, right? So mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's not realistic per se, because you don't have pitch black shadow mm -hmm. in real life. It's just how I take my photography. Now, if you found those images as a reference and you try and light it, you would have some challenges trying to understand from a technical point of view why isn't it looking the way I want it to look. Yes, uh, generally one of the things that I noticed as well, especially in my students, like you said, they were using these edited photos. And I actually had this quite several times, in, especially in Bacchashir. People were coming up with the edited versions converted into game lighting. And like the skylight was super dim, it was super dark. And I was like, saying, okay, you did this, that's perfect get out of your camera and try to see the environment as if you're playing the game and i'm like oh it's too dark yeah exactly that's what i mean so here is the problem with the exposure blah 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 and then i explain them what is going on so generally the difference between cinematic or like videography and game lighting cinema video photograph is just single image you control the camera but in games the player controls the camera, which there can be weirdos around who just, including me, I do it all the time, just go around like weird places, try to see what's going to happen. <laughs> so um, it is super important to have these multiple references to see the interactions, the ratios, how it will look when you're actually inside there. So again, um, it is like about what you're looking for. Hmm. I mean, there's definitely a good discussion for people to think a little bit about because if your initial starting point is poor your end result might possibly also be poor and then you're thinking it's your fault which brings back to the question asked earlier is what happens is uh, what to do when you lose uh, hope or preparing for a job or anything you have to often understand what's the Where's the obstacle really? Is it really you or is it just that the source information might be a bit misleading and once you solve mm -hmm. that, you, you realize you're doing a good job actually and it's just... Uh, yeah. Exactly. Again, this is where the being conscious about your surroundings in lighting terms is important because, yeah, you try to work on, let's say, the sunset scenario again. Uh, you try to work on this editor photo, it didn't came out as you liked it, so your shadows were not looking correct and stuff. Go out and take a walk in the sunset. And if you're conscious about the lighting scenario in the real world, you'll say, well, wait a second. The shadows are not as dark as it seems in that photo. And then when you think about it, and then when you check the actual technical side of it, which is, I'll call it the light ratio, then you will realize that it is different. Again, the, not just sitting at your home gathering photos will not be enough all the time. Again, it's super important to be conscious about the real world because basically it is what we are replicating. Mm. 
So where does creative leeway or expression where we break the rules come in? Hmm. Yes. So it is a matter of experience. The more you know, the more you're involved, the more you know when you need to break the rules or keep them. Because if you, as a beginner, try to break the rules all the time, how will you know when to apply them? So the, the most important thing is to getting these fundamental rules down first and then playing with them. It is like, it is same with the music as well. I used to uh, play music and uh, generally I, I play drums. So it starts with the rudiments. It's like fours and like doubles, singles and all these like rudiments we call them. And it's the basic beat is like, goes like, like this. As you get more experienced and when you have control over your limbs, then you start to change the notations. You'll add some more juicy stuff and it will feel different, but it's not going to feel bad. This is where I break the rules. The same for the lighting as well. When it feels good and does not feel that something is off, then you broke the rule perfectly. But it is important to know when to do it, when not to do it. So um, in games, we break the rules all the time. And this is what we do. Even in cinematics, we break the rules all the time. Because, whoa. <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, I, I want to say it's a matter of experience, but it is important to know the rules. All right. So talking about breaking the rules, do you want to go through maybe the keynotes or some of your art station stuff? And we can talk a little bit about where your uh, approach is for your lighting and maybe enlighten people who aren't aware of mm -hmm. the cheating mm -hmm. stuff we actually do. And we, we're complete liars when it comes to lighting. <laughs> oh, well, we all liars. We all game artists are liars. We just fake stuff. But yeah, I mean, um, you wanted to see stuff from Kena, I know that you're keen to see some stuff related to it, so um, let me Of course, go. I'm playing it. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so that Rod Parade, uh, let's talk about that a bit. Uh, you have a fan right in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me, the, the, whole, the, the whole team was amazing in that project, so it's not just me. Uh, like the wonderful team back in Ember Lab. It was one of the probably the best projects I ever worked. It was amazing. The whole team was amazing. The project was amazing. And actually it paid off with all these like awards that we have. So yeah, I think I am sharing my screen properly, yeah? Yep. So basically, um, this rod parade is one of the cutscenes. And I need to say, I can't go into the technical details too much because obviously, you know, um, I can't speak too much about it, but as much as I can tell, I'll try to explain it. So basically, this cutscene is one of the earliest cutscenes in the game where Kena uh, meets Saya and Benny. So I was responsible for the cinematic lighting in this shot, and um, generally, the cinematic lighting is done on top of the actual game lighting because generally, the game lighting is optimized. But in cinematics, since we're getting super close i like look at this shots for example they're super close on the characters so with the game lighting it was not possible to get that level of detail with all this like maybe not on the rod's face but if i go to kana's face in a close-up it is not a it's not possible to get these detailed shadows so this is where the cinematic lighting comes in. So um, in this shot, for example, there were lots of rules broken because even in some of the shots, we were changing the directional light sneakily between the cuts so that it will support the cut, the, the shot in the scene. But the important thing there is to make it subtle enough so that the player will not notice it. So this is what I mean by breaking the rules perfectly, right? So we know the directional light, the sunlight can't change its angle 10 degrees in like 10 seconds, right? But if you pay attention to these shots, the sunlight actually changes its direction slightly. 
because this is how I want it to be. So if you take a look close to the center of this shot, and then this next shot, actually it's combined here, you will see the shadows are slightly different, but you don't notice it because it is hidden. Because we don't want you to know it. Only thing that we want here is to give this feeling and make this shot work properly. So there won't be any ugly, uh, dr like straight directional light on the characters or whatnot, and blocking the light when needed, or these kind of stuff. And if you take a look at the environment here, it's like an open map. So for the cutscene, we added up some support lights, which even in the gameplay lighting is not just skylight and directional light, but it's also like light supporting here and there. So this is where we break the rules. So there are no hidden lights in the real world that, you know, lifts up the stones on the right side. But we do in the games because we need to tell a story or direct the eye of the player. So these are the places where we break the rules. So the um, the thought process in this cuts uh, this uh, cutscene, for example, was to have a warm environment because we wanted to feel. We wanted to make a really heartwarming shot in this. So this is. Um, one of the places like Kena, like I told, meets with Saya and Benny, and they were like surprised to see Kena being able to control these creatures because they were chasing these creatures, but they didn't know what they are. And this girl is able to talk with them and grab them out of nowhere and do these kind of crazy stuff. So we really wanted to portray that um, innocence in the scene, hence this like warm lighting and you can see the warm bounce lighting on Kena's face to make her look approachable, for example. And in Benny and Saya's face, like an, a low um, contrast lighting on their faces to show their innocence on that. So the, the, it, that is what I mean by the idea. Even if you are in a game, the ideas are important because without them planning these kind of stuff and just grab and I see these mistake a lot of times because people who try to do cinematic lighting is like, oh, three point lighting, here's a key light, here's a fill light, here's a rim light. Where's the creativity in that? So that is a big question artists like us should ask themselves all the time. What can I bring on the table to tell that story better? So again, in this shot, this is the background innocence, the childish innocence. And in here, Kana being approachable, friendly. And in the rots as well, you can see it. There's no dramatic lighting here. It's always open and it is always um, a warm lighting going on through the scene here as well. See, like this is all us being in the control of lighting. So maybe we can call controlling the lighting, breaking the rules, because lighting can be unpredictable in real world. So in cinema, cinematography, what people do is just blocking the windows, putting like black curtains or white bounce cards and stuff. So we fake it by breaking the realism, let's say, if that makes sense, right? So this is generally the base point of how I'm approaching to these cutscenes. So this is one of the easier cutscenes um, narrative wise, because again, it's just one idea. But if I go back to one of the other works, um, which one shall I pick? Um, let's pick this one. You can see a significant difference. Still, it has a key, a feel and a rim, but the ratios are different. Colors are different. And um, again, you can see that this is a totally different mood, totally different scene because it has the idea nothing is random. So if you take a look at this shot, if I stop it at the right time, um, here, you can see on Kena's face, there is a warm feel, but predominantly her face is in blues in like cooler tones so the idea here was all right the situation is dire we're in a cold place the situation is dire not everything is going accordingly but the hope kana's hope and 
her willingness to do that quest and her good side, let's say. This is how we reflected that. So this dilemma between the current situation and the hope Kena has resulted in this lighting. So you can see the warmth on one side and the cold, dominant cold everywhere. So the the metaphor here in all these bad stuff going on, there's always hope. Yeah? So it's really subtle, but there is an idea behind it. It's always like that. It's the same for the gameplay lighting as well. So, um, and then here's another example where we can use the colors in ideas as well. So the purple color is the color of uh, Corrupted Toshi. And if you see this color, you know he is somewhere. So this is another way of using the colors. And yeah, I think this is the brief of it. And if you take a look at the shots through the game, you can really see that difference. It's the color code as well. So the blue being the spirit world. Also, again, we know the cold colors of sometimes mean, meaning the hopelessness and the warmth is quite the opposite way and whatnot. So it, again, it, it is about knowing what you're going for. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> difficult question, maybe not by Patrick. Uh, you mentioned that it's a combination of game lighting with cinematic lighting on top of it. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, do you have a comparison of a shot between pre post cinematic light added? Unfortunately, no. Um, let me think. Well, no, he thinks I will just recommend you looking at the in-game shots of the same location and then the cinematic shot, and you yeah. should be able to see some. Uh, well, hopefully you don't see any differences, but if you really zoom in, <laughs> maybe you'll find some differences. They, they will see because you know they're, they're two different stuff. So the game lighting is generally shouldn't be that detailed anyway. I mean, not shouldn't, but generally it's hard to keep this level of detail. I mean. You can see even the shadows of the hair strands, but if you try to keep this level in gameplay in a third person game, probably that will be a bit hard to optimize and run in like all the consoles. Maybe it is easier to do now with the current the current generation now, PS5 era, but previously it was harder. So uh, they're significantly different. Hmm. Anil is asking, is there a big difference between lighting a realistic scene versus a stylized scene? Mm hmm, not that much actually, but in, I must say, it might be a bit harder to light the realistic scenes because in stylized, there is already a style that you know that this is not real. The proportions, the lights, the meshes, the shapes, the figures, but when you go for photorealism, even the tiniest thing can throw you off. So I think that that's the difference. The, um, the realistic lighting is more about the subtle details, while stylized is more about finding the correct tone. By meaning yeah, tone, it's not uh, just colors, it's just everything, even the art style. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think in stylized... It's it's more room for error in terms of picking the wrong color or or just the, the wrong um, creative approach because there's just more choices, right? There's more freedom mm -hmm. in stylized, so you're more likely to to maybe do something you shouldn't be doing, maybe even saturation wise. So uh, yeah, this is where the good art director comes in. Yeah, a lot of have you noticed that a lot of people who are doing uh, practicing lighting. Um, this is my observation anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a tendency to oversaturate everything, the colors and everything. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a huge mistake. Yeah, that's definitely something I noticed. So, yeah, have you been using Unreal Five? Yes, since so since what, the public beta. Good. So, what are your thoughts, tips, advice, things to be aware of when it comes to Unreal Engine Five and this all almighty lumens? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, actually it's quite powerful and so far I'm really impressed and I'm using 5.2 now as well. Um, the golden rule is if you're a game lighter, yes, all these crazy technologies, crazy full real-time stuff, still we need to optimize stuff. So we can't really go crazy, put a hundred different lights everywhere and expect them to run. So 
do keep performance in mind because Lumen is good, but still it is not the best in terms of performance. But this is probably the golden golden thing because like I see most of the students are like, oh Lumen, so I can go ahead and do this and that. Well, whoa, 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 wait. I mean, they, they're all like talking about, oh, I don't need to bake anymore. You still need to. Uh, so yeah, Lumen is recently started to be tested by companies and it will take some time for it to be a, uh, a mainstream thing. We will still need to know about like pre-calculated lighting stuff and pre-rendered stuff maybe. Uh, but yeah, we are switching from it. But yeah, Unreal 5 is pretty powerful and uh, it actually made everything much more easier because I remember me using Unreal, let's say 15 back in the time the stuff that was really hard to do back then is just one click now. That's it. But also, also, what I like about this is the fact that now it will create a larger gap between the people who just do stuff, just throw the directional light and skylight and be done with it. And the actual creative people with having a proper idea, having a proper um progression in the art of proper passion because back in 415 let's say people who were doing really realistic let's say arch with rendering was like it was so hard back then it was something that is unique but now again just drop a sky and what, what was the sun and sky component done or just put a sky atmosphere and expose properly done but that brings in the question, what can you bring on the table? And uh, I'm a hiring manager at Splash Damage as well. So I'm seeing lots of portfolios that has the same thing over and over and over and over again. It does not mean when you have something looking super realistic means that you are a good lighting artist. Being lighting artist is something different. Now, with all this technology we have, everyone can do realistic lighting if they know at least some of the fundamentals. But being a lighting artist is much more than that. So, so don't be fooled. Oh, sorry, just last one thing. Um, don't be fooled by this flashy technology. You still need all the fundamentals. You will still need to have all these knowledge. So it, just the tool is changing, not the fundamentals. So with the fundamentals and with things becoming easier would you recommend people to go more um, technical or actually develop their creative idea process and being part to being able to communicate things more creatively hmm. all right that's that's a really good question i think people shouldn't really uh, go in just one direction because there are technical lighting artists out there as well. So uh, some people might like to be more technical. Some people like to be more artistic. But in the modern world, if you're an artistic lighting artist, the more you know about the tech side, probably easier to find a job, let's say. Don't t quote me on that, but you know, too late. my observation. <laughs> oh no, uh, I'm, I'm doomed. But yeah, I mean, for example, you can be the best artistic lighting artist, but I'm talking about mid and higher. But if you don't know anything about technical, yes, you can learn it. But a creative lighting artist with this technical foundation will always be a step further than you. I'm assuming that the both people are the, at the same level. So honestly, if you can create really good ideas but can't execute them, that does not mean anything especially in the modern world. So with the increasingly easy tools that is kind of solving a lot of the technical issues that you sometimes needed a technical artist to do, you sometimes mm -hmm. needed a graphics programmer to do, which is now that need is diminishing, which means people who are very artistic and creative can express themselves quite easily. Mm. Uh, what do you think is going to happen then with the introduction of AI as well? Oh, it's not going to change anything. I 
don't think I, I see all these like harbingers like telling, oh, AI will replace artists. It's not going to replace artists, at least not for this 40, 50 years. That's what I think. It's going to be a really good tool, though. Sometimes when you need a reference, like we previously mentioned, but you couldn't find what you're looking for, AI can help you because it can generate what you're looking for. But I don't think AI will replace me or you or the people here as an artist because we are a mystical living being. We, we don't even know what's going on in here. We can't decipher what's going on. But AI is a set of codes and it currently has its limits. It's just going to replicate. It's not going to create. It's going to replicate. It's just going to combine stuff. Yeah, we are also combining stuff. We are replicating some stuff. But the way we are doing is more conscious. It's more personal. It's more organic. That's the better word. So I don't believe, at least for now, AI will change anything apart from being a good tool. So do you think the, the main thing that changes that it becomes a good tool or do you think as on top of it it will change the way we have to work might be it might change but still the degree of that is sought to be seen because we can't really predict what's going to happen in 20 years isn't it we could like take a look at unreal engine 5 i remember back in 2006 when i was playing oblivion elder scrolls for oblivion and i was like wow that looks real and look at the graphics now. I mean, I was playing God of War recently. Huge difference. It's like, how, how much years? It's going to be 20 years and 30, like 17 years ago. It's not a long time for this stuff to change. So I can't predict. So I can't tell 100%. But it will indeed change. Even now, as an example, just, the, just even now, we're still baking stuff. But in like a couple of years, Maybe we are not going to need it anymore. But right now we are baking. We are using like, like the hybrid methods are the most uh, common methods to use. Five years ago, it was just baked lighting. Nothing dynamic. It was maybe impossible to do it five, eight, whatever, 10 years ago. Like even like maybe 15 years ago, it was so hard to cast shadows on the meshes. These shadows are just fundamentals now. So honestly, I hesitate to predict but yeah, it will definitely change. Cool. Uh, we have a question by Filippo. Uh, what do you look for a lighting portfolio in a lighting portfolio? Okay, um, so this will be different depending on the seniority level. In a junior portfolio, what I am looking for is more to see their potential. I'm not expecting a junior to be super technical or like know everything about the techniques, but what I expect them to be I would like to answer that question. Will it gonna worth for me to train this person in the art of technical lighting and all the knowledge that I know? Will this person will become a good lighting artist? So I would like to see the potential. And I don't wanna see the same lighting over and over again in all the portfolios. So for example, a neutral lighting, a daylight lighting in a really good nanite meshes, this means nothing at the moment not nothing but it's not as valuable for me as a creative portfolio so for a junior i'm looking for creativity for a mid-level and senior i generally look for the same creativity in more controlled way in a more i should feel that experience in their creativity also i would like to see the technical side as well so i would like to see that they're aware of what they're doing and to be able to tell me what in their portfolio pieces are not game ready for example and what can be done what is going to be harder blah 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 so again the creativity is the baseline there and then the more senior you become the more technical i would like to see the portfolio but it is all about character because what i believe is generally I don't believe that we should be hiring a role. What I mean by that, we shouldn't be hiring a generic artist. We should be hiring Amit, we should be hiring Harid, we should be hiring Filippo. So that portfolio should show me what I'm going to hire. And 
what I will see from that person in the future, at least the glimpses of it. So this is important. And what are your opinion about artists in that case? So they don't have the work, but you, for some reason, want to consider them and you decide to give them an art test to test if mm -hmm. they're able to do it. What are your thoughts on that approach? Well, to be honest, depending, uh, obviously it shouldn't be a case in a senior, senior level and higher. If a senior or lead level person needs an art test to prove themselves, then there is something wrong. And the question is why we should even bother. But for juniors, yes. Because it's, we should be seeing how that person, sometimes the portfolio is not enough to see. Yes, there are good creative works, but then there are occasions that we would like to see how, I'm talking in my case, of course, um, we would like to see how the person thinks. And let's say, will that person's way of thinking will be suitable for our needs, for example. So for juniors, Generally, it is something that should be done, but again, depends on the portfolio, of course. And for the mid-levels, again, it's like a 50-50 thing. But again, the more experienced the mid-level is, should be less for the need for the artist. Because again, you know, the more experienced you become, your portfolio should portray you. Because I see lots of seniors and leads out there. I'm sure they have good experience under their hands but the portfolio is not showing me anything and how could i know i mean i can always bring in and interview that person but how would i know that person is not just knowing stuff in their heads but they're terrible at executing it because i had two different stuff you can know a lot of stuff but execution is something else and you know um yeah, it's the I, same I, as it's the same as having knowledge, but not necessarily know how to build the house of the. You yeah. know how to how to exactly. how, how to build the house because you read up on it, you saw a lot of videos, but then you actually have to do it, and you might not know how to do it yet. Exactly, exactly. So again, um, the juniors mm -hmm. should show their like quality, show their potential and their um, passion to work on this. From mid to above, they should show that they had the experience, they've been through, they've started to walk that path, and they now know what they're doing. Because again, when you're a senior, you should be knowing what you're doing by now. And you know, at senior, you start to uh, mentor like juniors as well and mid levels. But well, you actually start mentoring at mid level if you want to, which I already do. Uh, but in senior, I believe seniors should mentor regardless of who they are so you know i I'm, so, I'm actually a bit harsh on these stuff but it's what so, it is. so so would you say if you were responsible obviously in this case you, you you might be in hiring and picking someone and if you were to work with the senior would you say that a requirement to be considered a senior is the ability to mentor and teach someone else yes the more the better there can be some roles that will need someone that is super technical, a principal, for example. But my personal opinion, yeah, there can be like the best principal ever in a team. But what it's going to mean for the team when that person is just doing everything by themselves and not teaching anyone how to do it, how the people will develop themselves and what is the point of being in the team anyway? if the people are not going to progress in the team. So what I mean, the higher up people should be able to, they don't need to be perfect teachers or perfect mentors, but they should be able to express the ideas. They should be able to at least to tell their juniors or mids what to look for, if that makes sense. I mean, that's the type of lead or principal, whichever I'm going to be in the future, I'm aiming to be. So when I'm being asked a question, I should be able to answer that as best as possible. I shouldn't be like, mm, you know. Okay, makes sense. So we're nearing the end of the stream. So two things going to happen now. Harid is going to have an opportunity to give top three advice and tips <laughs> to lighting artists. And as well as there's going to be our usual ending video as well. Um, 
And uh, if you have any more questions, this is a good opportunity to ask questions. We can give you uh, some time as well. Yep. Um, if not, we're going to talk more about AI art. Actually, you know, if everybody has some, I actually have some more time. I can do a game side of breakdown from my, one of my portfolio pieces as well. I think it's going to be uh, a good example of when to break and when to use the rules. Yeah, let's do it. So, oops, where's my mouse? There you go. So, oh, let, let me just find it first. Um, but this is because he said he has more time. Otherwise, we stop at one hour out of respect. But uh, since he is the one who said he go on, let's go on. I mean, if people <laughs> want to go on, I'm here. I, I can go on as long as I'm not hungry. And I just ate an hour ago. So ah, nice. <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. Um, bum, bum. Entire screen, yes, guess, yes, I did it. So this scene, uh, I did this in, like, I think, three years ago. It's like it says two. I'm sure it's like three now. Um, it, so that that scene is one of my favorites in the portfolio because, like, uh, it obviously got like lots of um, overwhelming positive response from people. But some techniques I used here. Well, the first time me actually using in something that I created professionally and the stuff in there, the physical exposure and combining it with the actual gameplay stuff. So to, to break it down, this scene is like a Last of Us inspired scene that um, I was inspired by Last of Us Part 1. And going back to one of the previous questions about the references, this mood board was huge. It was like literally littered and cluttered with tons of images. But I cut it down to these images. So on the left side, you can see that this is the color scheme that I actually used in my shot. So from the left side, I grabbed the color scheme and general feeling of an interior from the game, which I obviously like a lot. It's like artistically is like probably one of the best contemporary games in art directions like amazing and on the right side you can see that it's just real photos real photos of abandoned places and abandoned houses and clutter actually that's a concept from the game as well um, and the middle row is actual concepts from the game for me to be able to um, get into the mood of me actually, let's say, working in Naughty Dog and trying to create that scene. So um, I cut down this stuff that is not helping me and I left with those. So in these ones is what I was focused. As you can tell, the, the colors are quite different than what I did here. They are even more high um, high key lighting than what I did here as well. But the thing that I wanted to grab out of these images, how the light interacts in an interior like this. So um, these references were useful for that one. And as you can see, there are different versions of this. Some of them are edited, some of them are natural, and some of them, yeah, this is edited as well. And this is how I combine the ideas together. So going back, colors and how it looks in the game from these ones. The ideas from the game team themselves, the concepts that I found online, and the real world. So as you can see, as you can see, I'm combining my idea with reality. And this is where actually I have my initial idea of where I'm gonna break the rules and where I'm gonna keep them. And through the execution, it is the actual phase of, um, how to tell, trial and error to see when the rules are working and when they're hindering me. So one of the greatest examples here, this scene, like I mentioned, has a physical exposure. So this is set to EV5 and the outside is set to EV10. Normally, if I would do this scene naturally, in EV10, an environment that dark is supposed to be around two, three EVs. And just to remind, each EV means double the lighting. So there's a significant difference 
of lighting intensity in 2 EV compared to 10 EV. So in the first iterations of this shot, of this scene, the actual scene, it was set to 3 EV, if I don't remember wrong. Yeah, I think it was 3 EV. And then when I finished the scene, the exterior was completely blown out because back then we didn't have access to local exposure and these kind of like crazy new tech. I'm not, not maybe not new, but like, let's say recently introduced to Unreal. So it was not looking pleasing. So this was where I broke one of the rules. So this is like a natural lighting, but I lifted the interior lighting intensity to a degree that is higher than normal, higher than physical and real still keeping the same mood but making it brighter and exposing to a brighter EV, I was able to control the exterior and interior much better. So this is like a really good example of how to decide when to break or when to use the rules as well. So the technical sides of this thing is, so the only actual light source here is the window, right? So in real world, it is just a skylight. But the issue here, if I would leave it with the skylight, I wouldn't have all these small nuances and all these subtle specular changes and different varieties in lighting. And I don't know how much you can see from the stream, but there are like a strong specular on the bed and on this uh, nightstand. And this is what I'm using to separate the bed from the background, also keeping it end of the focus because it's like a really strong specular and in a overcast scene you probably might not find that strong specular on a diffused surface like this but i needed it and this is what i call walking in snow without dropping your footprints because this is just me placing two additional lights one baked one stationary to get these details and to concentrate the eye towards what i want to portray as the most important thing, which in that regard is the bed and the details in it. And uh, for the environment, in some of the areas, there are like fake lights or like feel lights in this terms of cinematography, the feel lights to lift up the dark shadows. And for example, here, the nightstand, the area of the nightstand was super dark and it was a bit hard to see. And I was like, all right, I will actually need more light here so I dropped this fake light in here made it static so that it's not gonna cost any performance and then dropped it down again I broke another rule if that environment is a natural scene the only light source that you will find is the bounce light and the lights coming from the window right but in here I'm adding an invisible light source that actually represents this bounce light so I'm basically breaking the rules of the physics in here, right? Because there's an additional light casting more rays in the scene, if I'm to be more physics, this physics terms. But I, th I think that's like, uh, that's clear, I hope. So this is like the, um, how to tell? This is how I approach breaking and keeping the rules. So uh, I so hope that's useful. <clears throat> if you were to do it again, is there anything you would do differently? Oh yeah, totally. I would implement the new tech as well. So uh, I would totally set it back to probably a, uh, a more physically accurate EV just for fun. And then using the new tech, local exposure and like the better tone mapping controls to naturally create that gradient that I would do. But the method would be the same. Still, I would use additional lights to control the eye and stuff. I would just, the, the technical side would change. Again, this mm. relates to the things that we spoke. The editors, the methods will change, but the fundamentals are always the same. Mm. So, when you, in your experience, would you say there are multiple ways of getting an end result, even if it isn't physically correct or technically accurate? Say that again. Do you think there are multiple ways of getting a good image, despite it not being physically correct or yes. even technically correct? Yes. Actually, this ties up to a tip that I would like to give to people who are struggling with lighting. One of the most important things is to finding your own way of doing stuff. So you're, you will have your own taste. You should have your own taste developed to approach to the scene. Some people like to work more 
on the post. Some people like to get everything done in lighting. So there are multiple ways of doing it. G going back to the scene that I did, this Last of Us scene, some people, all of the other people would do it differently because everyone has different approaches. So um, th this is a really important thing to be, um, you know, nailed down as fast as possible, in my opinion, to find your way of problem solving in lighting terms. That's, that's really important because Harid will solve it differently, Amit will solve it differently, so on and so forth. When you work in a studio, of course, there will be like a centralized way of problem solving, but it's always good to have character in your uh, problem solving. This is what makes you a unique lighting artist. Cool. Um, Vesley has a question. Uh, for someone who is transitioning careers to become a lighting artist, is it suggested I learn tools such as Maya, Blender, Substance Painter, etc., mm. or focus almost solely on Unreal Engine? Hmm. So, here is one thing. When I'm talking about in AAA size, of course, in like larger teams, generally a professional is expected to be proficient in their field. So as a lighting artist, I'm expected to be proficient in lighting. But to be able to communicate with the team and to be able to a good team player, I should know about modeling. I should know about textures. I should know about PBR. I should know about VFX. But a lighter is not expected to know these other departments as much as a professional, let's say, environment artist knows modeling or a professional VFX artist knows about VFX. So how I explain it, be super proficient in what you're doing and know enough of the language of the other disciplines that is connected so that you will be able to speak the same language with your team and the members of the other disciplines. So going back to the actual question, it is always valuable to know Maya Blender, Substance Painter, but if you want to be a lighting artist, I suggest you to n concentrate on Unreal, um, Photoshop, DaVinci Resolve, because these are the main tools that we're using. But the more you know about the other disciplines, the better for you. Because, for example, one of the most common problems that we face all the time are the materials. They can be darker than they are supposed to be. So this will happen in all of the teams, in all of these studios. And the people who created the materials come by and say, hey, your lighting is making our materials super dark, go and fix it. And I was like, if I didn't know about PBR, I would accept. And okay, let's just tweak the lighting once again and it's gonna break for anything else. But since I know about PBR, I can go to them and say, hey buddy, so here's a problem with this. It's supposed to be here, so it is not appearing correctly in lighting. It was for you to take a look at it and then Let's say they go back and, oh yeah, you're right, and then blah, blah, blah. So I should know how my light will react in certain types of materials and certain albedo ranges and whatnot. So um, long story short, I guess I spoke a bit too much on that. S concentrate on Unreal, Photoshop and DaVinci. But when you have time, also learn about modeling, texturing, especially texturing. That makes sense. So when it comes to these things and your experience, what are some of the summary or advices you would recommend for the newcomers, but also your experience? Because earlier in the conversation, mm -hmm. you also mentioned that you've seen seniors or mid that probably could mm -hmm. showcase their abilities a bit more. Uh, in at least you know online or portfolio wise when they apply and stuff so what do you advise for that how to you know make them improve or showcase themselves a little bit better oh be curious just be willing to know more and that's what some people really make me angry because they just like when i speak to them it's like oh no i'm a lighting artist i just want to do lighting come on you're gonna be a team team player and it is not going to be easy both for you or for the other people in the team if you can't speak the same thing. If I can't go to, let's say, material artist in my team and say, hey man, um, so you dropped this here, but it's causing me issues because, let's say, your albedo is a bit darker than it's supposed to be. 
it would be annoying for them to say, rather than that, it would be super annoying to say that, hey, your material is broken, your material is horrible, it's black, fix it. I would actually be annoyed if someone would walk to me and say, your writing's horrible, fix it. What is horrible about it? What should be fixed? So, like, the environment artists, in my opinion, should know a tiny bit of lighting to tell me, hey man, I mean, the shadows are too cluttered here, don't you think so? I was like, oh, oh yeah, you're right, maybe. How we can fix it? Is it can be fixed on my side or shall we fix it in the environment? These all bring up the ideas. Same goes for the level design as well. If I didn't know anything about level design and I won't be able to speak with them. So let's say there's one of these more cliche scenarios. Like right? Let's assume we have a cave and the level designers just created an environment, but they're not giving you the enough possibilities of lighting it correctly for the gameplay or sufficient for the gameplay, that's the better word. If I didn't know about how to direct the player, I was not able to go to the level team and say, hey, what about this? Can we just do these tweaks? And it's not gonna break the progression of the game, it's not gonna break the progression of the level, but it will give me that opportunity in lighting. Rather than that, if I go and say to them, hey, change your layout, because it's not working for lighting. It's annoying, isn't it? Imagine, like you're lighting someone and your level design team comes and says you, your lighting is not working for the level, go fix it. This is not a feedback, this is just annoying. So that's why I think people should know the related disciplines as well. Again, not as much as a professional level designer, because let's be honest, it is a superman's work to be 100% proficient in everything. And in triple A, at least in my experience, I never saw any generalists and you know if you're a generalist you're more like having a percentage of everything rather than being 100% in something and having like smaller percentages in other stuff because that generalist let's say spend 10 hours on 10 different stuff I spend 7 hours on lighting 1 hour on modeling 1 hour on texturing and 1 hour on other stuff I still can speak the same language but my main expertise lies where I should be expert into. I mean, um, one of the, I wouldn't say annoying, but one of the things I've noticed people, either they say it very clearly uh, or they say it indirectly is, I'm going into lighting because it's easier. Like that's the... That's I dare them to come in and do it. I really dare them come and do it. So, you know, have you ever heard that? Like, I did, even, of course. Uh, yeah, that's that's. Man, I'm telling I you, in in Turkey, when I, like in the beginning of the conversation, I told you, like people are telling, oh, lighting artist, I don't need you. My modeler can do it. Yes, your modeler can drop some lights, but they can't really know how much a point light differs from a spotlight and performance perspective. When to use a point, when to use a rec light, when to bake, when to uh, cast dynamic shadows, when not to. An environment artist can't know that. Not as much as me. Not as much as a lighting artist. This is where expertise lies, and this is where big productions differs from smaller productions, because the experts are hired for their expertise. That's the difference. That's very true. There's definitely um, time for more appreciation for lighting. I remember sound went through the same thing in games there's still probably but it's less now that oh we don't need to put so much effort in sound and music it's not really important and then you know people start appreciating and then as storytelling in general also went through the same process you know storytelling and all these cutscenes are really important and now i think mm -hmm. lighting is going to similar similar process in which you know it is already going actually uh, from what i see is already going and also in a large team if one of the departments does not, what is going to affect all of them? Again, let's imagine that you have an environment, that level design environment and lighting and VFX are working together. What if you can create the best looking environment, but the level design is just horrible? Then the people will not enjoy it. Then it is automatically a col collective failure because just one department is not working. So all departments are equally important. This is this is what I think because if one of the departments fail, automatically others will fail in the eyes of the people. And yes, we are doing the games for people, not for professionals. That's true. 
it's the same thing I remember with the people making games. They want to make games that they play while you're making games for, you know, the, the potential people who want to mm. enjoy it. It's definitely very important, I think. Yes. So, any more questions? So many good portfolio in by awful lighting, so many constant errors, lighting is one of the most technical difficult parts, but in mind are they found, be especially general is. A lot of activities in the chat, appreciate that a lot. I am, however, getting hungry and thirsty, so we're <laughs> going to be uh, phasing out though. So while you think about more questions, and as I said before, um, some of you are already uh, students of Harid over at Vertex Schools, a very great place to go learning. I've yet to do it, but one day I probably will go, yeah, I'll see what I can learn, and it's always good to learn from different places, I think. <laughs> now. Obviously, we also have some courses which are, you know, if you want to learn some more or similar stuff. So, you know, you can stop by lightingbot.com, have a watch as well. Here's a video while I go and run uh, for some more water. So you can watch this a little bit and I'll be back in a <laughs> second. Green screen is right behind me, and I have to climb over so fast and everything just to get there. Oh, that's what I like about my place. It's small and it's like really minimal. I can just do straight fast actions quickly. <laughs> so, Harry, obviously you have a lot of experience and you have a lot of th uh, insight to come with. So, mm -hmm. do you have any final words you would like to pass on? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully this is going to be helpful for the people. And um, like I told you before the, before the session starts, like uh, what I, why I came here back when I started, I didn't had uh, someone that is showing me the path apart from the art directors, which I'm grateful. Uh, but there were no one around me to teach lighting, but in return, people were just mocking at lighting and thinking is not important. But here I am, developed myself through all these years. And I don't want young friends to be in the same place. And uh, I would like to help people as much as possible because I've been on the other side. Now I am on the other side. And I will want to help people to find their ways to this side and to chase their dreams easier and to be able to uh, find their paths if this is where their passion lies to. And uh, yeah, uh, what I can tell if people want to reach me out in anything, please feel free, don't hesitate. Just a warning though, I am a bit a bit hard to reach sometimes, I can miss messages. So if I don't respond, send me a second message, I will definitely come back to you and you can reach me out through LinkedIn. Actually, I would like to say art station as well, but my art station is like, I don't know if you see that. Still His art station link is in the description for easy grab. So yeah, I already put your art station. Uh, yeah, well. but it probably is better if people, if anyone wants to reach me out for a message or a question, is it probably LinkedIn or email would be the best way to reach me out. They, they can find the links in my art station in uh, about page. Or they can uh, also find it in the chat. 
Oh yes, thank you. But yeah, if they go to our station, they can find it in anything like uh, LinkedIn and stuff. Cool. Yes. It's great. Uh, also a reminder, uh, even though we had a great guest today, Harid, and hopefully he can come back in the future as well. Hopefully. Maybe some bigger, multiple people can have a conversation together. We do have over 80, probably 90 interviews about lighting artists across the industry from old cultures, you know, all different countries. So do have a watch. You know, there's a lot of insight, a lot of different viewpoints, which I think is important to be uh, to get out there so no people don't think there's only one way of doing things because that can be scary for people who are struggling or having a difficult time learning so I think it's good to be aware of it and similar to Harit Sreden this is why we have Lighting Bot it's to make it accessible and easy for people to get alternative choices we have a free discord free to join you know get free feedback meet other people other lighting artists students recruiters so on so you know you can also reach me there as well um again thank you for watching i will borrow Harit in private after end the stream oh, no. just to just to talk to him a little bit more but thank you so much for your support leave positive comments in the video itself like subscribe show Harid your love and hopefully we see you again thank you so much for joining and have a great week next week. Thank you.